Hi online family, Maddie here. We're here at church getting ready for Sunday and I'm so excited that you're a part of this message. We're a church that loves God, loves people and loves life. And I'm praying that this message is gonna speak to you, it's gonna inspire you and uplift you in your journey in life. So why don't you go ahead and share it with someone in your world and let's be all a part of what God is doing together. So I would love it if we could stand and give a big Colonial Church welcome to Pastors John and Helen Burns this morning. Good morning. I feel like saying hello, family, because that's what we feel like. You can take your seats. Thank you. How great is the team around here, Johnny? I know, I know. We are family. I love family. I really do. And it's amazing that we get to be part of family all over the world. And I'm so thankful that you prayed for the Ukraine. I mean, they're our family. Um, I don't know if you know that, but we, we have Hillsong Church in the Ukraine for many years and in Russia. And, you know, when you watch the video of the newscasts, we've been there many times. And, and we're singing that song, I'm Not Alone. And I, I felt, I was emotional, like usual. But, um, but there's many, uh, you know, many that are hiding in fear in Ukraine and in Russia, because there's many that don't want what's happening. And they need to know that they're not alone. Okay, and, and yes, God loves you. So we love you, we love your pastors, we love your church. We really, really do. Um, we are God's favorite, sorry. <laughs> I guess you get to be God's favorite too. But we really do feel like we're God's favorite. Because not only do we get to, you know, travel and, and come to the most beautiful place in the world. We were so obviously. sad to leave the snow, you guys. <laughs> I it, can't believe we're here and we don't have to wear masks in here. Like, hello. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Freedom. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we, we left. If you're wearing one, it's okay. We don't judge you, but w I am very grateful not to be wearing one at this moment. We, we left and it was icy. Yeah. It was cold. I golf almost every day. I, I, I speed golf, I run, but you can't run in the mud. I mean, it is so muddy. It's quite entertaining when he comes home after he has been running in the mud because it's a very hilly course and every once in a while he comes home in the morning, he's just full of mud. And I thought, what happened? He goes, I slid right back down that hill. <laughs> and I don't know, I find that funny. <laughs> and I wished I was there to watch it. <laughs> I'm it's like, don't talk that in the house, all right? It is awful. <laughs> anyway, um, we love being here. Love your church, love your pastors, and we're going to share just a little bit of our heart and our life, and this is so much of what we're made of, right, what we're going to share, which is about legacy. We're going to talk about building a generational legacy, building a legacy of generational blessing, and really to understand your life, you can't without understanding what's gone on before you and what's going to follow you, okay? You and I, our life is a piece. It's, it's like a page out of a huge book. And if you take a huge book and tear a page out and say, here, this is your life, figure it out. You cannot figure out who you are from one page. You gotta know the whole story. And just to understand that part of it is really important. And um, I really did not understand a lot of it because I was kind of grow up you know, I, very me-oriented. Anybody else in the room? I came out of the womb, me, mine, gimme, gimme, gimme. And uh, I, I've had to learn a lot of things, but I married this crazy girl who, um, who has this heart for people's story. I've often said, and it's true, if you get caught in the elevator with her, by the third floor, she'll know your story. She, she just wants to know everybody's story. It's important to her, and, and it's it's become a, a big part of who I am and why I am. So as we talk about this, I think my heart is that you leave changed, okay? And you recognize that what really changes you isn't so much what you get up here, it's what you get down here. 
And there's been so many times that I've, I've left something changed, but I didn't know what it was. I couldn't quite understand it. First time I went to Hillsong, I came home changed. I couldn't put words what happened, but the thing is you can't unsee what you've seen. And it changes everything. And I, my, my, I think when we come together like this, that should be the part of the goal, that we leave changed. And really, the, the choice you have to come here is the desire you have to change, to be more like who's hanging around right here. So before I just open up just with, with a quote and a scripture, speaking of story, it was just over 14 years ago that we first met, and I remember meeting Maddie and Jill. Today's a very significant day in the lives of their family, and, and we were, I was there at a women's conference, and I still remember, um, you know, Jill stepping up on stage after a really sad moment in their life when Max went to heaven, and um, she led us all in worship and sang that song that she's very known for and many others, but I remember that just over 14 years ago as she led This Is My Song in the Desert. And we were all deeply, deeply impacted, but who would have known that our stories would have been knit together, that we would have so fallen in love with these two. And so sitting here today and seeing all of you feels really surreal in many ways because I think God, God did that way back there, just knit our hearts together in a beautiful way. And then a few years ago, we were in the foyer because this building wasn't finished yet for you to all come. But it was a dream and it was a passion. I remember them telling us they're planting a church and then this, the beginning and the unveiling of it. So today we're sitting in the second service after a great conference yesterday and watching what God is doing. Never take for granted the story that God has written you into. And you may be here online listening for the first time or in the room for the first time. But God is writing a story, and you're part of a story that started long ago. And I sit here today deeply touched by the, by the blessing of what God did. And in one of the hardest seasons of their lives, you were on the other side of them just carrying on with God, of not giving up when life was hard. They just kept going, kept clinging to God, holding on to each other. And, and those choices, you were on the other side of those decisions to just trust God and to keep going. And so this is way bigger than you can fathom or understand. And yet these are such early days. So you can only imagine what God will do. You are a gift to this nation and a gift to the world. And so take the, the weight of it in a healthy way and recognize you are part of something stunning that God is writing a story through you. A great friend and mentor of ours, he's been in heaven now for many years because we met him when he was in his late 70s. Dr. Lester Sumrall was a real general in the faith. And the last service we ever heard him preach, he, he said these words and I wrote them down years ago. And he said, in the area of science and technology and every other area of knowledge and learning, knowledge has been passed on from generation to generation and only in the air." Only in the area of passing on a spiritual sword or baton have we often failed. It seems that every generation must begin again, and this is not right. And he made the declaration that God's plan was for every generation to take responsibility and prepare itself to pass on that baton of righteousness. We can't give you, you can't, we can't make you righteous. Only Jesus can do that. However, we can, each one of us, live our lives in such a way that God is visible to all, that what we carry is a faith that speaks of the greatness of God and the declaration of God. And so it's our job to pass it on to the next generation. And you may be here today and say, I'm just a kid. What are you talking about? Next generation. Somebody's watching your life. As a young child, and I love that about this church, I just looked how many people left the building, right, this area. with You will have babes in arms and children everywhere. Oh, it's just breathtaking. And if we could see what was on the other side of what's happening, it's bigger than you know. Psalm 119 verse 90 says, your faithfulness is from generation to generation. Um, Psalm 22 and 30, tell of the Lord to the next generation. Psalm 45, one of my favorite psalms in the Bible, verse 17 says, I will make your name to be remembered, remembered 
to the next generation. Psalm 145, generation after generation stands in awe of your work. Each one tells its stories. And success without a successor is failure. Let's not drop the baton. We have work to do. We are here for such a time as this, and there is a mission on your life. There is a mission and assignment on my life. And yeah, life isn't always easy and just, you know, tiptoe through the tulips. There's a lot of hard things we have to go through. But I love the story of this beautiful church that is birthed out of the heart of people that were willing to press into God and press on. They had no idea when they kept going what was on the other side of that. And I know that they still have no idea of how great it will yet be. But that is what God does with people who will just stay faithful to what God has put in their hand to do and not sit down on the job when it gets tough. Tough people, we're going to go through things, and, but we can get tougher through it. Not tough in our own ability, but in the strength of God. Far too often we look at inheritance that we pass on as being the stuff. Money and stuff. <laughs> That's so small. The inheritance, inheritance we pass on really is the heart value. It's the spiritual um, ground that we have taken, that we've accomplished. And recognize again that none of us got here alone. And to understand your life is to understand you have a baton. Because yeah. life is not a 100-yard dash. It's not even a marathon. It's a relay. It's a marathon relay. And every one of us have a baton. You have a baton. And you did not get it alone. It is costly. Mm -hmm. Think about how did you get here? Mm -hmm. Who paid for you being here? Not talking just about the chairs you're sitting in and the room that you're in, but your life. Who sacrificed and paid that you could be here? And when you begin to understand mm -hmm. the cost that has been paid for the baton that you have in your hand, mm -hmm. you don't dare drop it. Yeah. You know, years ago, I had the privilege of standing on a platform in Australia. Actually, it was Hillsong Church. Back in the day when the college was a lot smaller, and there's about 350 students, very international gathering of people. And as I had the privilege of stepping onto the platform to teach them that day, I felt such a weightiness of what, what, what I was carrying. And I felt the Spirit of God say to me, you did not get here on your own. And I was so aware of people that had paid an immense price for me to be there. My grandparents had uh, faithful, and today it's a bit tender as we've been praying and I'm just watching the stories because they, were, they had to escape Russia during the Bolshevik Revolution back in the early um, 20s, uh, 1920s. A, a, an incredible story, stories they would make movies about today. Um, I think about how they imparted and lived a life of faith and always made God big. We, we heard, I knew it was hard, and I, I, would, I would hear their stories. But in it all, it was never, life was unfair, life was too hard. There is so much loss and so much persecution, but they always told me about the bigness of God. You know, they taught that to my parents, who in turn taught it to me. And one generation, you know, God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God is the God that I have been blessed. And you may be here and be a first generation. You might today, maybe the day you say, Jesus, I choose to follow you. But it all starts there. God is here. Someone prayed for you. Somebody carried you to this place, if you will. And today you can begin that journey. And it'll make a difference for generations to come. So understand that. And I am so grateful for people that were not afraid to tell us their story. And I'm also thankful. My grandparents and my parents, not all of our story is beautiful. It's not. It, it's not all just, oh, we, we're, you did everything perfectly. No, there's some heartbreak in their stories. But you know what? They got up again and kept going. And they kept persevering. And I am so grateful for that. And I'm glad that they told me, not just about the, the, what they did perfectly, <laughs> but what didn't go so perfectly. 
And when you think about the Bible, God writes this beautiful love story to us. But he, he told the story of his family. It's messy. It's complicated. Not all God's children behaved well. And I love that God tells us, you know, that, that David was a man after God's own heart, but he also puts the story in that David was an adulterer and he was a murderer, that, you know, that Moses said, I can't speak, and yet God called him to speak. And just, and Paul persecuted Christians, but God called him. You know, Peter denied Christ, but it didn't stop him from being called. So wherever you're at today, let's keep the story going. Let's not sit down on the job. Let's not drop the responsibility. Get back up, shake it off, realize, yeah, that's what I did, but I'm going to get up today. God, you be with me. Come with me. I'm going into the future living for you. And, you know, her relatives, um, I'm part of it now. I'm married into this. And um, when I'm married uh, into yours, yours is pretty great too. Yeah. <laughs> but understanding that there's a big story and that gives cost to the baton that you carry. There's cost and there's a weight to it. And I don't think you know how to carry it till you know what it cost. And I'm pretty sure you don't know how to pass it on till you know what it cost. And what it costs is, is much bigger than what we do with our life. We need to pass it on and the next generation should actually start on our shoulders. Yeah. Not start where we started and have to go through everything we, but what, what, what we've learned, let's pass that on. I'll never forget Brian. Um, actually, you know, um, when you were there that first time, I wasn't there, but I met Brian afterwards. And he said, your wife, <laughs> uh, uh, he was in tears. Why? Because generations and not all a beautiful story, but it took generations for Brian to get there. And, and one time I'm listening to him talk about the legacy and passing it on. And he talks about how his kids, he wants his kids to start on his shoulders. Like for instance, he said one, there, there was a time that I, I just wanted to, to build a, a church and may, maybe fill you know, a room like this. And, and then, 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 then maybe like fill a bigger one. And, this, and then what do you think? Maybe a stadium. We could fill a stadium and have a conference. And he said, you know, but my, my kids don't dream of that. They've already seen that. That's a given. They're dreaming much bigger. And you see, every one of us, as, as we live this life, we pass it on, we actually uh, allow them to start on our shoulders and go way past it. And that's the way it's supposed to happen. So how do we pass on this baton? How do we build generations like this? And I've got three things that I think um, it's, been, it's meant a lot to me for years. Just understand these three things. Number one, Catch the vision. Catch the vision. And I say catch the vision because it's more caught than taught. Okay? You don't decide your destiny. You discover it. And when you get around your destiny or people that are living your destiny, something stirs inside of you and you can't unsee it. It changes everything. And so when I say catch your vision, you recognize that we all need a vision. Jesus said, make the tree good and its fruit will be good. Okay, the tree is your vision. It's your life. It's what you live. And the fruit actually talk about generations then. But he, he didn't say, check out what kind of tree you are. He said, make it. You and I have a, a job to do. We need to actually build the vision on the inside of us. But we don't decide the vision. We discover the vision. So it's more caught than taught. And if, if you looked at where that vision comes from, where that godly vision in our life comes from, I think there's three things. Number one is the big story. You, you should actually do the work to find out the story of the big picture. How did you get where you are? What the price that was paid for you to sit here, to be here today? Number two is God's word. Because God's word is his story. It's, it's the big story, and you're in it. And words paint pictures. 
There's a picture of you in his story. There's a picture of your children, your grandchildren, your spouse. And if you look for it, you find those pictures and that vision on the inside of you. Again, once you see it, you cannot see it. It begins to change everything in your life. And the third place you get a vision from is the people you hang around. Proverbs 13, 20 says, hang around wise people, become wise. Hang around fools, become a fool. Hang around successful marriages, have a successful marriage. Hang around people that work hard and have great integrity, you'll work hard, have great integrity. You choose your future by the people you choose to hang around. I really believe that's, the, that's one of the biggest, if not the biggest reason we come here. We come to church. People say, well, what church do you go to? Uh, the one closest to home? No, not necessarily. The church that you go to, well, I, I, because God's there. No, God's everywhere. The church you go to is because who's there? Because you see something that you want to become more like. And it starts with vision. So catch the vision. You can't give away what you don't have. And, and the vision in your life is the beginning. Everything starts with vision. So you need to actually do the work to catch the vision. I love hearing you talk about that. It's always been your passion. You know, I think back... Her, her grandfather. Okay, oh. I, gotta, I gotta talk about this a little bit. Which one? One was a little better behaved than the other, but... Uh. <laughs> These Mennonites escaped Russia. They went from 40 below zero in Siberia to... Celsius. Celsius to 40 above in Paraguay. And her grandfather was the pastor. He starts this little church in Paraguay. And, uh, you know, he, she has his Bible... And in the front of his Bible, our names are in there. And it's this little church in this little town. It's called Fahrenheim. There's one traffic light and they don't need it. <laughs> and that little church in that little town has planted churches all across the world. Some of the largest churches in our nation come from that little church. It's called Generational Legacy. A friend of ours, Paul Cole, he made this statement. He said, um, what you do in life becomes history. What you set in motion becomes legacy. And so recognize it's bigger than, than just us. So catch the vision. Go ahead. Sorry. No, it's beautiful. The second point we'd love to share with you is set a standard. What does that mean? Is do the best you can with your one life. You know, uh, there's so many things that I could say about this, but one thing I live very close, just aware of, and more so than ever today, is that, you know, we have this one life, this one precious life, and the most important day of your life is today. It's today. We don't know about tomorrow. Yesterday has passed. So this is a moment that we have to choose to make really good choices because every single decision you make takes you somewhere. Bible teaches, choose this day who you're going to serve, life or death, curse or blessing. And he, it's a multiple choice question, and God gives you the answer. He said, choose life so that you and your descendants will live. That's in Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 19. And so we can't make someone else walk in a godly way, but we can influence someone. As Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. That we are to live in a way that heaven's watching you know, teach us to, to live with a heart of wisdom. Teach us to understand the, the, the brevity of life. Because we don't know. And I'm not trying to be somber and negative. I'm just telling you, you have this one precious moment. And what will you do with your one precious life? And so that takes intention. It takes setting a standard. For example, you know, when we got in our hotel room, um, in our beautiful hotel room here in in this gorgeous city of St. Augustine, one of the things I did is I set the thermometer, the thermostat, um, to the temperature that we would feel comfortable in. And, um, and we do that. And I think same with our life. You set it. Someone doesn't set it for you. You might have had people that have tried to take you out and have made things hard for you, but bottom line, my friend, you set the standard. There had to be a day where I had to make a decision. As for me and my house, we're going to serve God. 
because there was a day that I had, even though growing up in the most beautiful home and family and in church, I was born on a Sunday, and I'm sure I was in church the next Sunday. That was just a story of our, our family. But there was a day that I walked away from that, and for four years, I didn't go to church. I was very backslidden, and there was a day that I had to do what some of you may have to do today. I had to get on my knees and say, God, I've had life with you, and I've had life without you. And from this day forward, I set a standard. I will not live one more day without you. And then I had to make a decision. I don't know if John's going with me. I don't know if he'll join me in this journey with Jesus it went all out because I knew I was going to give it all I had. But I had to do it anyhow. I set a standard. And I didn't force him to come with me, but I think my life and making those decisions and praying differently began to set a standard in our home. Our daughters, Angela, Danica, and Ashley, were on the other side of that decision. Our grandchildren, a church was on the other side of that decision. Us being here today was on the other side of that decision. And then I had to not just set the standard, but I had to choose to continually. And John and I have done that for the last 43 years ago, that that is when I bowed my knee yet again to Jesus. So what I did is I couldn't force my kids to tell them what to believe, but we could live it. And as for me and my house, we're serving God. And so that was a setting of a standard. And I want to encourage you that you are who you are when you think nobody else is watching. What you do when it's just you and God on the scene is who you really are. And that's just, I think it's a somber, it's a sober message, but it's an important one. Because no, it, it doesn't really matter as much what everybody else sees. I mean, it does. But the most important person who's watching, yes, it's Jesus, but it's you. Yeah. You know who you are. You know who you are when no one else is watching. Be the best you can be. And sometimes you think, I'm stuck. I can't get out of this. I'm an addict. I'm whatever. There's a way out. Because somebody has paid the heaviest price. Yes, the weight of what we carry by what others have carried is huge. But nothing greater than the salvation that we have received because of Jesus. That is what has set the standard for me. And that standard invites us to walk in a way that is holy and, and not perfect because we won't get there. But you can do it. Set the standard in your life. You'll never regret it. And today may be the first day you just make a decision. You know what? This is where I'm going. This is what I choose. And watch what God will do. So catch the vision, set the standard, and impart the power. It doesn't do you any good if you don't give it away. A baton's not something you keep. You don't put it in a bank. You give it away. And every single one of us, we have a baton. It's a spiritual legacy that we need to pass on. And uh, I'll never forget years ago was Darlene Check, um, and she was teaching at Hillsong Conference, and, and she said this. She, she said, spoil your kids. Get them on the platform early. Spoil them for the world. Let them know how amazing it is to serve God so they never get trapped outside. And I think about how many of the, the next generation that are just wanting to move up. And in a lot of places, I mean, like, it's my job. And, and I'm going to do it as long as I can. It's not about you. It's about the generations. And you need to actually pass that on as, as soon as you can and help that next generation step up and do all that you're doing. And they're going to make mistakes. And you, so you help them get back up again and, and correct them. That's imparting the power. You know, our, our Pastor already mentioned it, but um, two and a half years ago, I handed the baton, this, to my daughter to be the lead pastor in our church. We planted the church 36 years ago. I was a dentist. I decided to um, hang up my drills <laughs> and uh, plant a church. It was the best thing I could with my, you know, do with my life. And, and we poured our life into it. This baton that I passed on cost me a lot. It cost us everything we had and everything we have. And who was I going to give it to? People wanted to know. You know, and there were, were others that wanted that baton. And actually, my daughter was on staff, and her job was to help me figure out who to give it to. We had no idea it was her at the time. But she finally came to the conclusion, as I did, that no one else valued it like she did. 
No one else knew the cost, knew what was paid for and valued it. And so she came to the place where she knew that she could not not carry that baton. And that's kind of what that next generation needs to know from you is what it costs you. And, and, and when they know what it costs you, they, don't, they, they, they want to make sure it doesn't get dropped. And that's when they pick up what you have and they take it on. You can't make them, but you can invite them. I love this younger generation. They're passionate. They're passionate. They don't want to just live for any old reason. They want to give their life away for a reason bigger than themselves. Well, why don't you live that life for them and then pass it on to the generations? Amen. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for your spirit. Thank you for everyone here. Thank you for the, the multitudes on the other side of every heart turning to you right now. Lord, I ask you that you would build your church in and through us, way beyond whatever we can imagine or think. We give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God we love you, church. Well, I hope that message inspired and encouraged you. Well, before we finish, I would just love to ask you one question. The question is this, have you ever said yes to Jesus? I'm not talking about knowing of Him. See, that's education. I'm talking about knowing Him personally. That's a relationship. Friend, I wonder if you've ever said yes to Jesus, opened up the doors of your heart, surrendered ownership of your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that if we believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord, and we confess with our mouths that God raised him from the dead. Romans says that we will be saved. I wonder if you've ever made that choice. I wonder if you've ever said yes to him. I would love the honor and the privilege of leading you in a prayer right now, right where you're at, into a new life-giving relationship with Jesus Christ. It's as simple as praying this prayer. And if you're ready to make that choice, why don't you just pray this prayer right now with me? Say, dear Jesus, thank you that you love me. Thank you that you died for me. And thank you that you rose again so that I could have life. Forgive me of my sins, of all the things I've done wrong. I make a choice today to follow you, Jesus, to be a child of God for the rest of my days. Amen. Amen. We are so excited. If you pray that prayer, you're saved. We believe you're on your way to heaven. But what we'd love to do is give you a free gift from our church. It's a New Believers Bible. And if you pray that prayer, we would love for you to reach out to us at colonialchurch.life and we will send you this free gift of a new Bible to you. We are so excited as you take this first step in your new journey of faith. God bless you, church, and we'll see you next week.